to another episode of The Misfits. We're fun, we're flirty, we're over the 30. <laughs> Hey everyone, I am Liza. <laughs> and I'm not Liza. No. I'm Emma. Exactly. And it's been a while since we did one of these. A few weeks, in fact. More than a few weeks. Seems like forever, darlings. Life has gotten in the way, but we are here now. And we've got, uh, we've got an interesting uh, subject to bring oh, to you. Oh, we have got a great subject today. You're really going to enjoy this one. So we had an email from David, and he had a good question. Is it David or David? We're going to go with David. Okay, let's go with okay. David. And he said, can you explain pumper carbs and their benefits? And I thought, you know, I even own a pumper carb. And I really don't understand. But everyone talks about upgrading to a pumper carb, right. also known as a flat slide. Well, you're getting ahead of yourself there, Liza, and because that's two separate things. And we'll talk about it right now. Perfect. So I pulled off the carburetors from my KZ400. And would you say these are just typical carburetors you find on many carburetors? These bikes? are representative of CV carburetors, which is um, constant vacuum or constant velocity carburetors. And this is an example of a pumper carburetor. So we can examine the differences between the two. But what I want to do is just talk about the basics of what a carburetor does, because we know these are carburetors. Mm -hmm. um, we might know what the components are inside them, but to understand what they do and actually get into the basics of that, it's really quite helpful. So um, let's start with let's start with the pumper, because the question is about the pumper. I have the first question. Yes. Is there an actual pump on the carburetor? There is indeed an actual pump on the carburetor. And we are going to dismantle it right now. It's right there. And so, in order to show you what's going on, we're going to undo three Allen keys. Allen screws, I beg your pardon. I'm using an Allen key to undo them. And I haven't even seen in here, so we might actually open up this chamber and somebody's stolen it already. <laughs> it is possible. This is a live TV, folks. It is the recycle garage, after all. Well, you know, we've got to keep it down to recycle garage standards. All right. Oh, I'm excited, are you? This is usually where things spring out. Well, they're going to. Yes. Pretty glued together. Okay, here we go. Oh, that is a nasty Ooh. one. All right, so here are some of the components in a pumper. And, <laughs> oh God, this has been a while since it's been apart. This is actually the pumper itself. This is a rubber diaphragm. Mm -hmm. And its purpose is it moves backwards and forwards via a plunger. And it actually pumps neat fuel. And we'll get to why that's important. Wait, should there be that coming out of it? No, I mean, this is byproducts of running unfiltered fuel through your carburetor. And you okay. can see all this disgusting gack. Um, so let's talk about what a carburetor does. And they all do the same thing. They achieve it in different fashions. But all a carburetor does is it takes fuel and takes air and mixes it in a very specific and accurate way. Fuel itself is not flammable. Right. There's a revelation for you. If I was to get a bucket of gasoline and throw a match in it, the match would go out because fuel is not flammable. What is flammable is fuel vapor. And there's a very specific ratio of fuel vapor that's at its most flammable. So if you take one part fuel and about 15 to 15 and a half parts air, it becomes extremely flammable. That is the magic figure, and that changes. And the reason it changes is altitude, heat, it's all about oxygen. It's the oxygen in the air that gives the fuel its flammable nature. And if the air is hot, the oxygen molecules actually in the air are more spread out. 
So you need more of it to get the same burn. That's why when you get up to altitude, you're starving of oxygen and your bike starts running fat mm -hmm. because it's still putting the same amount of fuel in there, but there isn't sufficient oxygen for it to burn. You'll also hear a lot of talk of cold air intakes. Now the air comes in this end, and the colder the air coming in there, the denser that oxygen charge, the more power you're going to get. Sounds okay. good. All right, so we're going to have a look at some of the components of this carburetor, and I'll explain through them. Um, most important thing is you can see what happens when you open the throttle. So the throttle cable goes on here and turns this wheel. And when you rev it up, vroom, vroom, vroom. But what actually happens is when you turn the wheel, you can see that there's a slide that opens. The more you open the throttle, the more the slide opens, the more charge gets in, inside your engine. So basically, the faster you go. Clear so far? So far. Now, you mentioned at the beginning of the show a flat slide. Mm -hmm. Just because it is a flat slide carburetor, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a pumper. The two are exclusive. You can have a flat slide carburetor without a pumper. You can have a conventional carburetor with a pumper. Now, let's talk about the slide. You can see that this is the slide, and we call it the slide because it slides up and down in the carburetor. And you can also see that it's flat. Mm -hmm. Now, this is the chamber that it runs in, and you can see that quite clearly that it's a flat chamber. Why are flat slide carburetors more efficient? Well, the one thing I can see is it's not as deep so it's closer to the air source, maybe? That's part of it. But for the size of the carburetor, you get more bang for your buck. Yeah. Now, let's explain yeah, that. Yeah, if we look at the width of this with the round sides. Right, exactly. Look at the diameter here. This is the size of the carburetor. Mm -hmm. And this, is, this actually, for a CR carb, is quite small. This is about a 32 millimeter. Maybe, no, it's maybe a 34, which is relatively small. These things go up to 50 millimeters. Um, most common size is a 42. Everybody wants a 42. But this is a 34. But you can see it's quite compact. Now look at our CV carb here. It's, a, it, it's actually larger. And yet, the throat is smaller. And this is what counts. We can also have a look. If we have a look at the slide in here, this is a more conventional slide. This is round. And you can see that there's little pockets here and here where the air can get trapped and turbulence can form. That is slowing down your engine. It's not slowing it down by much, but instead of the air passing through smoothly into your engine, it kind of gets trapped in these corners and rolls around and right. kind of falls in. And that's inefficient. Doesn't mean it's bad. I mean, these things have been around for a hundred years. But these are considered for high horsepower applications a better bet. You know what I find is interesting? The maker of both of these. Well, you know, there's only really two carburetor makers in the game for motorcycles. Um, Mikuni is one and Kahin is the other. Um, and these are both Cahins. And these are both Cahins. Mm -hmm. um, Cahin formed an alliance with Honda many, many years ago, and for the longest time, Hondas had Cahin carburetors. Um, Mikuni, they were favored by Kawasaki and Suzuki for a long time, but Honda did like their Cahins. And Cahins have gone a very, very certain way when it comes to the design of carburetors. Now, the unusual thing here is these are K-ins and these are off uh, Kawasaki. Exactly, KZ400. The KZ400. But K-in was slightly ahead of Makuni in CV carbs. And that is why Kawasaki chose these. Now, what is a CV carb? I shall tell you. Ooh. 
Yes. Constant velocity. Or constant vacuum. It constant depends. vacuum, dang it. So either, well, but either or is just fine. You can express it because you're basically expressing the same thing. Now, if we go back to this carburetor, and we see that when we open the throttle, we're directly opening the slide. Vroom. This one is different. I can open the throttle on this. Right. And you can see that the slides aren't opening. What this does is open a butterfly at the front of the carburetor. And that's all it's doing is opening a butterfly. What happens from that point when you open that butterfly and you start the air moving through this, which is called the venturi of the carburetor, or the throat. When you start the air moving through here, there's a pressure drop. There's pressure differential. This is how planes fly. Planes fly because the air on top of the wing is moving faster than the below the wing. It provides lift. So we have a pressure differential and the slide raises itself. So you're saying this is how you do a wheelie? Right, basically. You lift the front wheel in the air. Exactly. Got it. Exactly. So, um, there we go. CV carburetors versus slide carburetors. But we're deviating from the original question. Yes. What is the advantage of a pumper? Well, a pumper you tend to find in two applications. You tend to find it in a racing application like this. This came off a little race bike. Um, probably a very small capacity one, I'm guessing a 250. Do you know what this came from? I don't. It's a small race bike, but it's where power is important. And the way carburetors work is as good as they are at sensing the demands of an engine, if you're in a high load application, say you're going up a hill or you're pulling off the line and you give it a big handful of throttle, the engine's demands can actually overtake what the carburetor can provide. And this is where the accelerator pump comes in. And so when you open up the throttle, it moves this cam, pushes a plunger down, and operates this diaphragm and you actually get a squirt of neat fuel completely undiluted fuel through this little jet here and it goes straight into the throat of the engine and so for that momentary second when the engine's demands are highest it squirts neat fuel in there and it gives you that extra boost and so in a performance application mm -hmm. it is actually a very desirable thing to have. Back in the days when dirt bikes had carburetors, they're mostly all fuel injected now. Um, and the fuel injection works with a computer, they can factor all the engine's demands in. But back when they were carburetted, virtually every Japanese dirt bike from the 70s onwards had an accelerator pump. Because it's that desirable to have. The other application is in a very, very high economy application. Hmm. And the advantage with a high economy application is you can actually adjust the fuel air ratio on a carburetor. And you can really adjust it so it's so lean that it's bordering on causing the engine to run badly. The engine is still running good, but you just get this ridiculous amount of fuel economy. I see. So in a very, very high economy situation, you might also find a bike with an accelerator pump. You can set the mixture up so it's so lean, the bike will run great, but when you have that high throttle opening demand, the engine would stumble. So they put an accelerator pump on it just to get you beyond that. Do you remember the old um, Honda 250 Rebel, the twin cylinder one? Yeah. All of those have got accelerator pumps. Really? Yep. Tiny little CV carb with an accelerator pump. And they're very economical bikes. They do between 80 and 100 to the gallon. Well, 
Thank you. That explains everything. Well, so, it's, it's half explained. And I want to make sure that people realize I could talk for hours on these things. They're nowhere near as complicated as you think they are. But I would like to do a complete lesson on carburetors. Um, and we'll do that some stage in the future. Don't be scared of these things. You shouldn't be. A, a well carbureted bike is a wonderful thing to ride. There's, there's a smoothness and a creaminess to a power delivery of a, of a carbureted bike that you simply don't get with a fuel injected one. They're very old school. And actually it's one of the first things I introduce people to in the recycle garage when they're learning. And here's why. You can completely dismantle one of them. And if you don't remember how it went back together, you have the next one to open up and see. Right. So when you're working with two, three, four carburetors, it's a great thing to learn on. Just do one at a time. And guess what? If you like old motorbikes, you're going to be working on these things. It's as simple as that. Because if you drag something out of a shed that's been there for 20, 25 years, it's all about the carburetors and the fuel. There you go. Well, David, I hope that answered your question. In fact, he had one more question. Oh, really? And I'm going to go ahead and let's, let's go ahead and tackle this. He says, also, can you bump start a fuel injection bike? Yes. There you go. There is a caveat, though. If you have a low battery that's not sufficient to turn the starter over, yes. If you have a dead battery, no. Um, the fuel injection runs via the bike's ECU. The ECU is powered via electricity. And if there is insufficient electricity in the bike's battery to fire up the ECU, it won't wash. So a low battery is fine. Dead battery, get that thing charged. Um, you should never really run any bike with a dead battery because you run risk of frying your charging system anyway. So whether it's fuel injected or not, generally if you've got a completely dead battery, either get a battery in it or get it charged up before you even attempt to start it. Well, there you go. David, thank you very much for sending yeah, your question. Yeah, thanks for the question, David. That was a good one. And if you would like to send a question, you can email it to askthemisfits. That's M-I-S-S-F-I-T-S. -S at gmail.com. Yes. And don't forget to like and subscribe. Also, check out our podcast, Motorcycles and Misfits, to learn even more about motorcycles. Right. So thank you very much. Thank you, guys. I think we're Thanks ready for to watching. Get out of here. What do you think? We did another episode? We did it. <laughs>